Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. And joining us today is Tim Sandifer. He's a principal attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation and heads the foundation's Economic Liberty Project, which protects entrepreneurs against intrusive government regulation. He's also a Cato Institute adjunct scholar. Today, though, we're going to be talking about the politics of America's second best sci-fi media franchise, namely Star Trek. In a, in a recent article on this topic that you wrote in the Claremont Review of Books, you make the provocative claim that, quote, the development of Star Trek's moral and political tone over 50 years traces the strange decline of American liberalism since the Kennedy era. So I guess let's begin at the beginning. Um, the original Star Trek was a product of Cold War America. So did that or how did that influence its political outlook? Well, I think it wasn't just a product of Cold War America. It was also the product of World War II. World War II obviously was the worst catastrophe that the human race has ever experienced. And it dramatically affected the way that people thought about politics and about uh, justice. In, and that those thoughts, I think, are found throughout Star Trek, uh, the original series, which, of course, began in 1966, the brainchild of a, of a World War II veteran, Gene Roddenberry, and many of the stars themselves and the writers were, the, were, were veterans. Jimmy Doohan, who played Scotty, was himself a, a decorated war veteran. So um, what you see throughout the show are discussions of ideas about human liberty, about justice and freedom that are rooted – in what I think that the liberal West thought was the post-war consensus about justice, about human rights, about the role of the state, about technological progress and reason. And I think what you, what you see during the three years of the show, the rise of the new left that rejected that consensus in large part, uh, and you can see that permeating some of the episodes. For ex the example I give in, the, in my article is in the episode The Way to Eden, which is an episode in which the, the Starship Enterprise encounters a group of space-age hippies who are looking for some paradise planet of their own without any technology. Uh, and it's, you know, it's obviously a satire of the hippie phenomenon that was going on at the time the episode aired. And you can see the writers and the producers of the show who are from that World War II generation really struggling with how to deal with this new wave of thought that rejected the idea of technological progress, universal human rights, of basic liberalism that the older generation thought was well-founded at the end of World War II. I mean, they, here's the end of this war. They thought that the idea that all human beings have rights that no government may justly interfere with, the, the United Nations was going to lead a to a, a worldwide liberalism rooted in technology and humanist values. And here comes this wave of, of opponents and they, did, they really didn't know how to deal with that, I think. So is it accurate to say sort of to boil it down to say that absolutism was something that kind of animated earlier Star Trek, that there were principles about freedom and rights that after confronting the Nazis who had been very bad, that these were principles that were not relative and so they were fighting for something uh, in, a, in a way that was somewhat influenced by World War II? Yes, that's right. I think um, a good example of that is one of the better episodes, The Conscience of the King, which is an episode that's sort of a play on Nazi hunting because throughout the 1960s, you saw these prosecutions of former Nazi war criminals, most notably uh, Adolf Eichmann, but actually quite a, quite a few. Some of them were going on while this series was on the air and – this is an episode in which Captain Kirk encounters a character who's basically like a Nazi war criminal, and he's, you know, asked to track him down and punish him for his crimes. And the whole point of this episode is, who are you to judge? And which a character actually asks Captain Kirk, who are you to judge? And Kirk responds, who do I have to be? And that's the theme of the episode is – that everybody is subject to judgment. Nobody can escape by saying, well, it's just my culture. It's my society. It's a different time. It's a different place. You can't judge me. Um, and I think the world war, the post-World War II generation that had seen the Nuremberg trials and so forth were very committed to the idea that all human beings have inalienable rights and that no, uh, no power, including religion, has any legitimate basis for trampling those rights or ignoring them. That, that idea permeates the original Star Trek. Was that idea at the time unique to Star Trek and science fiction or was this something that was just generally going on in the genre? 
I think it was going on throughout television at the time. You see it in um, more sometimes cloying ways in some of the more uh, uh, tedious television shows of the time. Like Leave It to Beaver. Uh, there's an yeah, I would, that's what I'm thinking. Is epi- shows like like Mayberry and so forth. They 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 all had these very obvious morals, but the morals to them were things like you know everybody deserves a fair trial when they're accused of wrongdoing and that sort of you know very ordinary by our standards principles. But nevertheless, they were very committed to them. Star Trek tried to take those principles. And twist them a little bit, and and you know Gene Roddenberry actually consciously modeled Star Trek on Gulliver's Travels, which um, obviously was written as a way of of talking about contemporary society and satirizing it or indicting it in uh, in different guises. And Star Trek did the same thing. And the hopefulness too. That's another big element that Star Trek sort of it, that permeates Star Trek. I would say even currently that. That there's a lot of hope in the future, and and possibly in that post-war period, the the hope as opposed to any sort of dystopian type of future, like the idea that a bunch of people working together can fight for what's right and and win. That's right. It was very much an optimistic sort of welfare statist, um, humanist, gen- broadly speaking, liberal perspective. My favorite Gene Roddenberry quote. I remember he said in an interview once. Uh, uh, aliens in spacesuits didn't build the pyramids. Human beings built the pyramids because they're smart and they work hard. And that was his perspective. He thought human beings really could get past all the bad things in the world and could accomplish great things. Now, sometimes I think that sabotaged uh, some of the dra- dramatic possibilities of, of Star Trek. It, it, the re- writers of the next generation often found themselves – having a lot of difficulty coming up with good scripts because Roddenberry kept vetoing ideas saying no no human beings won't have conflicts among the each among themselves in the in the future utopia and that made it very hard to come up with <laughs> good stories for television so Roddenberry at well, times went too far before. in his yeah he he often went too far in his uh, utopianism but when it was when it was sprinkled in there, it gave it a real positive cast that I think contemporary Star Trek and a lot of contemporary science fiction is lacking. Now, there's an episode that you talk about in your essay called "The Apple," which you think is the quintessential episode of the original Star Trek. Can you tell us about that episode and, and why it is quintessential? Yeah, so the episode concerns the the Enterprise crew encounters a planet in which the people on this planet live in a sort of tropical paradise, but they're also deeply ignorant. They've never heard of farming. They don't know anything about technology. They don't even have sex because it turns out that the planet is ruled over by this god called Val, who controls everything that the people do through a sort of totalitarian mind control system. And he requires every day to be fed, and the people, the people of Vol, have to gather food and bring it to him. And he controls all of their thoughts and has reduced them to a complete lack of individual, individual initiative. And the idea was, is well, they don't have any kind of conflicts among themselves. Everybody gets along. Everybody's placid and peaceful. So isn't this a good thing? And Captain Kirk says, no, this is a bad thing because it deprives the people of the capacity for th- for thinking for themselves. Living on their own for their own ideals, and yeah, the the idea of freedom leads to conflict. You aren't going to have that placid quality of peace uh, as a result of freedom. You are going to have bustling conflict, disagreement, um, dynamism, const- c- creative destruction. That's going to be part. That's going to be what freedom is like. Um, but that is what every sentient being in the universe deserves is the right to try their hands at freedom. And so he orders the Enterprise to destroy Vol, which is in fact a sort of supercomputer that has been controlling all these people. And he leaves them to their freedom. Now, this episode seems to me the quintessential episode of Star Trek because the whole point of the series was about freedom and individualism and liberating ourselves from the dead traditions of the past and recognizing that that means we will have – there's a downside to that. We will have conflict. We will have trouble and, and strife amongst us. But the rewards of that freedom are are worth the struggle. And I think a lot of people criticize that episode because Kirk blatantly violates what the so-called prime directive, which is the rule that in Star Trek the, the Enterprise crew is never supposed to interfere with the native culture. But in fact, the point of Star Trek – is that the prime directive is wrong and that a, a native culture that oppresses its own people has no rights – 
to do so and that that liberty takes precedence over these antique traditions. So does that set up then if the if the prime directive is call it what are the core values of Starfleet the and prime we yes, might actually call it the prime. Yes, and it's <laughs> it's wrong. Does that make Starfleet the kind of organization that Star Trek the show is antagonistic towards? Well, no. I think what happened is if you watch the original series episodes in order, you see that the Prime Directive was kind of introduced subtly in a couple episodes, and it was introduced as a foil. It's introduced for the for the dramatic purpose of breaking it in these original screenplays. Uh, the idea being that to to sort of satirize or criticize the idea of uh, cultural relativism or the hands-off, who-are-we-to-judge kind of attitude. That, that is introduced purely for the pur purpose of criticizing it in the original Star Trek. Now, it grows in importance as the, as the franchise continued its life in the, in the 80s and the 90s. It grew in importance in the episodes until the point where in the next generation it becomes this mindless dogma where we're never supposed to interfere. In a section of my essay that was actually cut out before it was published, I criticize an episode of The Next Generation in which Captain Picard encounters Encounters a race of aliens who have been kept in a drug-induced stupor by another group of aliens. They've actually kept the, this one race addicted to a, a drug in order to keep them as servants, as slaves. When the doctor on the ship, Dr. Crusher, when she discovers this, she's horrified by it and says, well, surely you're going to do something to stop, put a stop to it. And in one of the low points of the entire show, Captain Picard refuses to do so. He says, no, who are we to judge? It's the prime directive. I have no right to interfere. And he, he gives this ridiculous speech in which he says that in the past, any time that we've interfered with an alien culture, it's ended up badly for everybody. Well, that's, that's completely false. In fact, uh, it's, it's contrary to the entire basis of the original series, which was rooted, again, in this United Nations effort to it, bring freedom and modernism and liberalism and technological advancement to the peoples of the world. And now here's Picard saying, no, no, if one man wishes to enslave another, no third man should object, to quote Lincoln. Um, and that's Picard's, that's Picard's attitude, hands off. How does that play in? I'm curious in that – so the, the original Star Trek is exceedingly episodic. Um, there's not a lot of you know these – so one of, the, one of the things that tends to turn me off a bit about Star Trek in terms of the world building aspect of it is that it always – it doesn't feel to me like a universe that people live in and has a continuity. It's instead you know each episode is we're going to we're going to visit this thought experiment and then the next week we're going to go to another thought experiment. And so do we right. have do we have evidence that like the interventions that say Kirk did turned out well or does he intervene, no, it, it smash the computer and then we never go back to that planet again? Well, that you're right. We it's that way. And remember Star Trek was the first science fiction series that was not an anthology. That's one of the reasons why it was such a world-changing thing when it comes to television drama. It was the first time that a science fiction show had ever been put on television that was not an ep – every episode is different. But it did still have – because it was the first one, it still had a lot of the qualities of like The Twilight Zone or X-1 about it because that was what the writers were familiar with from their past. And so each episode does ha have this sort of standalone quality. But again, I think that the show was consciously trying to be like um, like Gulliver's Travels or something where every episode was making a statement more than trying to b create an alternative mm -hmm. world. And and so they didn't they, they weren't really particularly concerned with that. Now, as the show went on, of course it developed certain backstory and certain story arcs, but that's true even of a show like I Love Lucy has story arcs to it. We, we don't remember that now, but it does. And so they introduce Spock's father, and we get the, this idea that he's half human, half Vulcan, and all that. And yeah, that, that stuff is there. But really, the show was the writers were more interested in every episode standing on its own. It's Next Generation, and that series, that series, and the the shows that followed it that try to get into universe building. I would actually argue that that was one of the the things that ruined Star Trek was that it lost that surrealist quality that was key to the original show's 
um, longevity. The reason that people still watch and enjoy the original series and don't so much see the next generation as iconic in the same way that it's familiar to them because they grew up with it, but it doesn't stand out. 50 years from now the way the original Star Trek does. The reason why is because Next Generation was more interested in its own authenticity, whereas the original series was more interested in in discussing important, timeless questions of philosophy. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure I'll grant you your premise that, 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 as I mentioned before we started recording, that your, your preference for the old Star Trek is merely a product of when you grew up with that uh, and I grew up more with Next Generation and I think that that's pretty timeless too. But I want to get back to as opposed to like the world building aspects and the, and the and that kind of thing, that the problem with Next Generation is the the relative base is it the the relativism of the prime directive the kind of relativism that that engenders is that is that basically what, what the prime directive is? It's a sort of a statement of relativism. Definitely. I think what happened was by the time the 80s and 90s came along, we had gone through the Vietnam experience. And the Vietnam in many ways was the direct opposite of World War II. In World War II, we, we went out and literally saved the world. And in, in, in Vietnam, there was a lot more uh, self-criticism going along and it ended up with ignominy instead of America setting the terms for a new – wave of worldwide liberal freedom and human rights the way that World War II had. And so the even though Next Generation was still overseen by Gene Roddenberry in its in its initial stages, it was a lot more of the relativist style of liberalism, particularly post-1968 liberalism. To me, this all is symbolized very, very well by the 1968 Democratic Convention. You had Lyndon Johnson generation of Democrats who were this Gene Roddenberry post-World War II anti-totalitarian liberalism. And on the other hand, you had this rising generation, the new left, that was fundamentally anti-technology, fundamentally anti-capitalist, uh, deeply relativist, um, tune in, tune out, uh, turn on, tune out uh, liberalism. And, and the, the clash between those two occurred during the hiatus after the original show and, and before the next generation came on. And so then when by the time next generation comes up, you have this more relativist version of liberalism. But does this, this start showing up in the Star Trek movies before next generation comes on the air, right? Yeah, I guess a little bit. The, the Star Trek movies are, uh, are, are, very, in one way, they're fundamentally different from the original series in that the original series was always about going out there and dis and, and discovering. And the, the the movies are much less about that, especially the trilogy two, three, and four are really centered about these main characters. It still has the same spirit of the original Star Trek, I think, but there's there's a lot less of the inquiry into universal morality than you see in the original series. But there is a the another an, on that point. I will say another another deeply important point of Star Trek. One of the crucially important points of Star Trek that everybody seems to miss is that the point of Star Trek is that Spock is wrong. Spock is wrong. He's always wrong, and the reason is because Roddenberry introduced Spock as a way as sort of a foil to humans. He was supposed to be standing outside of humanity, sort of criticizing humanity, so trying to understand humanity. He was he was this other character who was pointing fingers at humanity and commenting on humanity. And Roddenberry loved humanity. He didn't love the Vulcans. He he was interested in talking about why human beings are special. So throughout the original series, you know, the Vulcans are very admirable for all sorts of reasons, but basically the humans are the good guys. And the reason why is because they have this special quality of curiosity and innovation and commitment that Vulcans don't really have. I think that shows up in the episode The Apple when Spock is perfectly willing to let the people of Vol remain enslaved on the, on the, on the planet, whereas Kirk says, no, uh, these human values are universal of the ability to think for yourself and, and so forth. And um, when you get to Star Trek II, Spock's sacrificing his life for the ship because the good the needs of the many outweigh the good of the few. Everybody thinks that line is so noble and great, but the point of that line is that Spock is wrong. That's why in Star Trek III he gets corrected. And his, when he asks at the end, why did you give up everything to come rescue me? Kirk answers, because the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many. The point and, – and the the climax, I think, of all of Star Trek is actually in Star Trek IV. What about the whales? When Spock, <laughs> the, the one with okay. the whales. When Spock 
Spock says they have to go rescue Chekhov. Chekhov has been injured in an, in his effort to restore the, the power to the spaceship so that they can escape Earth. And he's now in a hospital in San Francisco, and they have to go re- liberate him. And Kirk turns to him and says, is that the logical thing to do? And Spock says, no, but it is the human thing to do. At that moment, Spock becomes human. And really, the, the curtain on Star Trek, I think, the original vision of Star Trek, the curtain falls there. Because that is when we see the culmination of everything Spock has learned up to this point. He's died and been reborn and discovers human values are his values. Now, I would say that a lot of people would think that uh, – you mentioned something about the, I don't know, the morality of the next generation. But it strikes us as a deeply moral show for most people. It's, it's, it's almost proselytizing to the point of, of Picard's yeah. nobility and, and you do have things like uh, – there's an episode in The Next Generation. His name escapes me. Um, uh, something about drum. It's about, it's about a, a civil – it's about criminal procedure basically. They accuse this guy of a crime, yeah. of being a terrorist and uh, – and he, uh, we're going to get a bunch of tweets telling me what the name of it is. I'm sure, but accusing him of being a terrorist, and they and they and they want to torture him and give him guilt by association. And Picard gives this speech about how this is not what we do. We're better than this. Right. Um, I mean, that's pretty common. It's 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 not an an immoral or definitely not an amoral show. That's right, and and the evolution of Star Trek is very gradual. The first se- seasons of the Next Generation, um, many of the episodes actually were written for the original Star Trek crew and were kept on hand for many years and then recycled into Next Generation episodes. So the gra- the evolution of the show is very gradual. Roddenberry, you know, was, oversaw it and he got older and he died while the show was on the air. And his successors very gradually, I think, moved away from what he was trying to do. Until you have shows like Deep Space Nine that are really not the original Star Trek. Now, they're some of them are great. I think Deep Space Nine has some of the best episodes in the star, history of Star Trek, and Next Generation has some great episodes. I mean, oh gosh, the episode uh, the Nth Degree, for instance, is one of my favorites. Or, or what's the episode where Worf kills Duras? Um, an excellent episode directed by Jonathan Frakes. So there's some really good shows there. But I think what you see is Next Generation gradually be, turns away from commentary on universal themes and becomes much more distinctly political. A lot of the episodes are centered on specific issues, specific political issues of the day. And you know they have to send a message about environmentalism or send a message about some other current controversy and gets a lot less literary and a lot more um, uh, propagandistic. And I think the, that the growth of relativism is gradual also until the show really ends on relativistic notes where it did not start out that way. Remember, one of the first episodes is one where they have to prove that data is human. Mm-hmm. I mean that's a classic episode. That's That could have been an original series episode. So I don't mean that there's a, a, a point where you can just draw a line and say after this everything is bad. But I do think that you saw that distinct change during Next Generation – so that by the time that show went off the air, Star Trek had become something that it was very much not at the outset. I just looked up. It's it, the name of that episode is the Drumhead. Uh, that's that's the name of that episode. Yeah. Does that trend of relativism continue into the post Next Generation series? I mean, I admit it's I haven't watched Deep Space Nine since it was on the air, but my recollection of it was not that it was relativistic, but that it was more morally murky. Yeah, that's true. I think it gets a lot more into the gray areas, and I think it's some of it is really good drama, very very tightly written. Um, but it's a different universe, really. I think it's not the 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 mission of the original show, and um, and honestly, I liked Deep Space Nine better when it was called Babylon Five. <laughs> but um, the the sh- that show and and some of the other shows, I think. They just had drifted so much, which is fine. You know that that's what happens over time. It's just I think it's a different show. I there there's an episode here's here I don't remember the the title of the episode, but there's an episode where um, uh, Cisco explains to the camera how it was that he got the Romulans into to enter the war that's going on. That's I mean that's a crackerjack episode, but it's not it's not Star Trek. So how would you describe? Uh, uh, we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, if you were to sort of overview the morality, the liberal morality, and, and and I'm not, I'm not sure if you're using that entirely for the left or just general uh, bigger, big, bigger liberalism. But uh, from the post-war period to now, uh, 
and how that that morality has changed. I am using that word in the broadest sense. I mean liberal in the sense of broad liberal values because obviously Roddenberry himself was some variety of socialist and the show at many times uh, strikes certain socialist notes, which I find it amusing. They were unable to sustain uh, the idea that a world where there was no really capitalist exchange going on. By the time next, the Deep Space Nine comes along, the writers have given up on even trying to write drama in that world because it's so absurd, and they end up with no or an ordinary trading post sort of society. Um, but anyway, I, I think what you see is the show uh, – Star Trek begins with a, univer a commitment to universal liberal values. All human beings have certain rights. All human beings should use their reason, should, should not be devoted to blind faith, should not be vote devoted to mindless tradition. They, and the, the answers are out there, but they will raise more questions, and that's a good thing. That sort of commitment to what Virginia Postel has called dynamism over stasis, that's the core of the original show. Now, the time you get to the to – the, well, the end of the first line, but why, by which I mean the end of next, the Next Generation feature films. By the end of that, what you have is a complete reversal, a gradual but complete reversal of those priorities so that by the end of the Next Generation films, Picard is content to no longer be exploring uh, and seeks instead – uh, see, he, instead, he, he's satisfied with the idea of a rural village that lacks technology. What I mean by that is the Baku people in the uh, Star Trek Next Generation film Insurrection, who are presented to the audience as being this idyllic people who know about technology but have consciously rejected technology because they say technology takes something important away from them and that it's better to garden by hand and be satisfied with looking down at the dirt instead of up at the stars. Well, I think Roddenberry would have been horrified by this notion, but that is the, that's the Star Trek that we're left with at the end, and, and it's really – it's really – it's like it's going gently into that good night is what that is. I was curious about that criticism because you – I mean it's pretty clear that – at least I think that you think that Star Trek Insurrection um, is the low point, that that's – you know, mo like your heaviest criticism comes for when you're discussing that movie. And so tell me if I'm getting the plot points wrong. But my sense from your description of it was yes, these people – want to farm and want to live this simple agrarian life but it's not that they lack technology entirely it's it's like a background thing that they have access to so they're not it's not like they're living in poverty as we would think about it they're you know they have they're not they're not sick um they're not really wanting or destitute they're more just living say the ideal life of a Williamsburg Brooklyn Resident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it because um, the sh the film never bothers to explain to us how it is that they don't have sickness because the f according to the film, this this race of of aliens knows about things like warp technology and so forth, but have chosen not to take advantage of it because they prefer to live like the Amish, and this is presented to us as a good thing now. The morality, the moral, liberal, universal perspective of the original Star Trek was exactly the reverse of that. It was the idea that for all of its frailties and all of its sins, humanity will triumph in the end by the application of reason and by discovery and by science and, and progress. And this is a fundamentally anti-progress movie. Now, it is – I do think it's the low point of Star Trek before the J.J. Abrams films, which are an awfulness all of their own. But the um, but it's the low point in the sense that uh, – uh, not in the sense of badly written or anything. I mean there are some really lousy – just in terms of production uh, moments in Star Trek. Uh, I mean Spock's brain of the original series is is typically pointed to as one of the worst episodes of all time and I, I don't Who, disagree the, with that. What's the green guy that Kirk fights in the very famous – the Gorn? Oh, the uh, Gorn, yeah, the in the Gorn, episode Arena, yeah, which yeah. is – and and see the episode Arena is a good example of sort of the pattern of Star Trek. It's not a particularly good episode but it's a good illustration of what Star Trek does a lot of the time. So Kirk is is kidnapped and put on this planet with this – a hostile alien creature and is forced to fight against him against his will by some alien cre uh, beings and Sp and Kirk using his his reason puts together a cannon 
he um by he finds um, sulfur and saltpeter and he makes gunpowder and ma- builds a cannon with which he defeats the gorn D- but he chooses not to kill the gorn he, he refuses to kill the gorn when he can and the reason is because that's not what humanity stands for and when he makes that choice the alien beings reveal themselves and say surprise it was all just a test we were just doing all this to determine whether you people are worthy of su- su- of surviving and prevailing in the universe and because you have these commitments to these liberal values you are worthy of surviving now it's a silly episode but the moral themes are quintessentially the original series star trek now an interesting contrast to that is the re- is the the second generation version of battlestar galactica Um, The revived Battlestar Galactica was put together by a former Star Trek writer who consciously sought sought a way of creating an anti-Star Trek. The original – or the the next – second version of Battlestar Galactica was created purposely as an anti-Star Trek, and the first episode of it, uh, Adama – is confronted with this question. He says at the at the memorial service, he says, are human beings worthy of surviving against the Cylon onslaught? And that's the theme of the series. The theme of the next, of the second generation uh, Battlestar Galactica is, is humanity worthy of survival? To which the series answers a resounding no. Humanity is so awful for so many reasons that the Cylons are actually the good guys and humanity deserves to suffer and die. And the, and the series is extremely dark for that reason. It, it gets most of the questions wrong that it presents to the audience, and it's relentlessly naturalistic. So it's sort of a, a complete opposite of the original Star Trek series. Now, I, I, I derailed you for a second because you were talking about insurrection as being the low point. Um, we, talked, we talked about the Gorn um, and, and this idea of these people, these uh, – you said naturalistic. Um, but on that point, I mean you mentioned the Amish. Do you think that we should be really critical of the Amish as being anti-progress and they shouldn't be living the lives the way they should and and we should violate our version of a prom, prime directive and go into Amish villages and teach them the ways of, of liberal values and rights and rationality? And Snapchat and Instagram. And Snapchat and Instagram, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to, to some degree my answer is yes. I be, As a libertarian, of course, I believe they have the right to make whatever conscious decision they choose about how they live their lives and if they do choose to live a primitive existence, then that's their choice and they have that right. But I think it's immoral and and wrong. And, and I think, incidentally, that Americans have this sense of the Amish as being a quaint, harmless little uh, people who, who are cute and, um, and wonderful tourist attractions and so forth, when in fact they are a radical cult that is devoted to the opposite of technological progress and uh, devoted to conscious ignorance and there's no surprise that if you if you if you scan the the newspapers you find lots of incidents of horrific exploitation um, sexual exploitation and so forth that goes on in the Amish community that a lot of people don't pay much attention to because they think of the Amish as being cute when in fact as i said they're a radical religious cult but but we have on some level we have a prime directive in this. I mean, there's some sort of non-interference that we right. practice. I mean, I don't, I don't go. That's to right, my but that non-interference, is, that non-interference is still cabined by universal liberal values. So that if an Amish person is discovered sexually exploiting a, a, a child, for example, that they are brought up on charges in an ordinary civil criminal court and tried for violations of laws that are rooted in every human being's right to be free from those kinds of violations. And that's right. That's rightly so. So I think a a Captain Kirk in today's society would say, yes, the Amish, of course, they have the right to live their lives as they please within the limits of the rights that that uh, universal liberalism recognizes on behalf of every other individual. I'm curious about where we draw lines specifically in your criticism of Star Trek insurrection. It it seemed that – so let's accept that like they didn't have sickness. However, they managed to not have sickness and they weren't – they didn't appear to be exploiting the rights of their fellow members. This was simply a choice that they made to not embrace certain levels of technology, to not you know fly yeah. off to the stars or have computers or whatever else and it seemed it wasn't you – know, they, they were capable of thinking about the alternative and simply rejected it for their way of life and you were extremely critical of that on principle. You called that that lifestyle immoral and I'm wondering how we decide where that line is. So you know, we talk about – we kind of make fun of wealthy people today who are wealthy enough to live like they're poor. You know, So they, 
you know, it takes yeah. a lot of money in order to be able to just grow your own food and super reduce your carbon footprint and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but there doesn't seem to be anything if I mean if wealth and technology is there to ultimately enable us to live the kinds of lives that we want to, um, then what's wrong with living the kind of life that we want to? I mean, is it bad to go camping? Oh yeah, of course not. And and of course Kirk would not have had any objection to that sort of thing. But see here, we to answer that question, I think you have to. Well, he goes camping, doesn't he? Yeah, that's right. He does in Star Trek Five. I think you have to take a step back though and think in in meta terms about how the show was was written to answer that question. And that is. In the original series, if we're ever, whenever you encounter an alien race that's anything like the Baku people uh, in the original series, there's always something wrong beneath the surface. So a good episode – a good illustration of that is the episode Plato's Stepchildren. The crew encounters this race of, of godlike beings who live in a very sort of uh, uh, Greco-Roman uh, society. And they all have these super telekinetic powers and everything. And it, and they are all happy, of course. They don't suffer any illness or anything, right? Except it turns out that they abuse and mistreat um, the uh, one of the characters who's a dwarf. And they and in order to demonstrate their strength, they they come to later abuse and mistreat the Enterprise crew. In fact, the episode is most famous for having television's first interracial kiss between Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Uhura. Now. That is a good example of how in the original series, whenever you encountered an alien race that lived in what appeared to be a technology-free ide uh, ideal in a, in a sort of uh, a, a, a quaint village setting, there's always something bad beneath the scenes, behind the scenes. In The Next Generation, though, the Next Generation writers are content to present us with this cartoonish utopia that doesn't answer questions like – how do these people avoid getting sick and so forth? I mean that would have been the first question Captain Kirk would have asked if he had beamed into a planet populated by the Baku people. He'd have been like, how, do, how is it that you people manage to feed each other if you don't use modern feed, uh, agricultural technologies, for instance? And the Next Generation authors were content to present us with this kind of silly, cartoonish uh, situation that would not have withstood any kind of probing or anything. Uh, and the reason why is because the next generation writers were themselves wedded to this notion of I idyllic uh, technology free uh, somehow or another organic kale is going to make us all healthy stuff. And th I mean that's the attitude behind the writing of the show. So I don't think that the show can withstand the kind of question you asked precisely because it's it's written in a way that represents – a silly commitment to an idea that you can have a society with no, without technology and still feed everybody and still not get sick and so forth. And so you, I think the original series was fundamentally anti-utopian, and by the end of Next Generation, it's fundamentally utopian. Uh, that's a fascinating thing because the 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 it may encounter utopias that have uh, some sort of fatal flaw behind them in the in the original series, but. This, the people themselves on the Enterprise are living in a pretty good utopia the, like without capitalism and all these kind of things uh, that Roddenberry is from a socialist sort of leanings that, that they themselves yeah. are living in a utopia that itself is socialist uh, in its own way. That's that's a good point and it is a, I think it's a solid criticism of Star Trek that um, – that mo almost all of the conflict takes place outside of the of the bounds of the Starship Enterprise, and that, as I said it, before, the original or the Next Generation writers often found themselves uh, ha handicapped by the fact that Roddenberry would not let them have conflict between the characters who on um, who are members of the crew of the of the Enterprise. Roddenberry always wanted the crew of the Enterprise to get along and not have conflict amongst themselves, and it made it difficult to write good drama. Now, for the original series, I think it kind of works because if what you're trying to do is comment on issues or th broad themes, it's helpful for the drama that the crew all get along. But even so, there is a little bit of tension now and then. I mean, McCoy and Spock have this sort of funny relationship where they tease each other a lot but in you know sometimes it's not funny sometimes McCoy really appears not to like Spock and Spock appears really not to like McCoy <laughs> are you out of your Vulcan mind yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so the, the the prime directive though it's interesting I'm, I'm still not sure I'm totally on with your thesis to some extent but I also think that uh, some of that relativism that what we're kind of calling relativism that the next generation kind of exhibits uh, 
some of it would be a backlash to I think let's say 19th century anthropology kind of thing of the sort of well we met some savage races out there in the uh, boondocks and it's so very very uh, paternalistic without any sort of understanding of different ways people can do things that are still acceptable under certain circumstances but also the prime directive seems pretty useful for non-interference as a principle is something I might prefer because I don't know if I can endorse that as a principle of power because there might be people who want to interfere with me or with my people who think we're not doing things correctly. So I'm thinking of, for example, international human rights lawyers who would love to violate the prime directive to uh, put labor laws, who think that it's a, a right to vacation, a right to health care, a right to all these things that, that, that are things that they would like to use force to put onto us. So maybe the best sort of compromise is something where you say, I'm not going to get involved in your affairs and not going to force things on you if you don't force things on me. And that creates a, a more livable situation. Maybe. And I, I think these – some of this is stuff that's too complicated to have presented in a television drama of, of one hour a, a week in the 60s. So, so, so at some point, the show is too broad to get into some of that depth. But – I would say the point that the original series is making in criticizing the, the Prime Directive is precisely the fact that there are certain universal human truths and that the idea that culture or, or ha a hands-off practicalities should trump those truths is expressly rejected in the original series. So that in today's parlance, you often, people often bring up the example of female circum genital circumcision as being a cultural practice and should the West just look the other way about um, uh, genital circumcision of little girls in the third world. And I think the, the original Star Trek's writers would emphatically say, no, we should not look the other way, that all human beings have, have certain rights and no society can legitimately violate those rights and that we are in the right to go into another country and say, no, you may not mistreat people in this way. I think that is what the original series is saying. Personally, I'm on board with that. But the you are right to say that one of the reasons why Next Generation pushes that away is because of sort of the anti-colonialism movement that was just getting underway while the original series was on the air. So you don't see a lot of it in the original series just because it, it really wasn't a cultural as big a cultural phenomenon as it became in the years after the show went off the air. But the the sort of anti-colonialism uh, notion that a society has a right to govern itself without without any interference from outside gradually takes root and is a real infection in the side of the of the next generation. It makes it very hard for the next generation to stay true to those principles of universal human rights while simultaneously believing that a society has the right to govern itself however it wants and if that includes violating individual freedom, then that's okay. And that's why you have such awful episodes as when Picard says, yes, if they're, these people are being kept in a drug-induced slavery, then that's okay with me. But would you rather live in a world where interference was was generally okay or people who believe themselves to be – because that was my question, like sort of the – Think about the religious wars of the fifteenth and you know the, the sixteenth and seventeenth century, where everyone sort of thought they could interfere in everyone's life, and that created a really bad thirty years war. That they kind of decided with the Westphalian compromise that we're just we're just going to let we're not going to interfere because a bunch of people thinking that they have principles that are universal, who think they have the right to interview people's inferior people's lives, is is actually fundamentally dangerous. Well, this this actually, so, I mean, if I can quickly interject that. As we were discussing this and as we were discussing the notion of you know the, the original Star Trek is very much this post-war um, notion of liberalism plus moral absolutism and a strong sense of who the good guys and bad guys are that and then and then that we should intervene to stop people who are doing things that run counter to this that you end up seeing a possible like mirror image of the original series of Star Trek in say the day the earth stood still, which is the the enlightened aliens coming in and saying, look, this this America of the right. post-war moral consensus of absolutism is actually going to destroy the whatever I don't know the world of the, the galaxy, world, yeah, that yeah. this is this is really bad. And unless you knock it off and get past this kind of moral belief, we're gonna destroy you. Yeah, no, that's a good point, and I and I think that the question about well, you, you know, the earlier question about would you rather live in a world where 
the the difference between the religious wars of the of the 15th century and what we're talking about here is that um, religion is nonsense. I mean, that's the fundamental difference between the two. And something very uh, important to Roddenberry, who was deeply anti-religion, and who and the the show uh, shows that repeatedly in in the episode The Apple, in and in many other episodes. Um, the one episode in particular in which they um, uh, the god Apollo appears to the Enterprise, and in this case, it actually is the god Apollo. It's not some fake, and the Enterprise makes it impossible. Or it, it, he ends up, you know. Uh, basically destroying his power source, and Kirk gives a speech saying, "We have outgrown the need for gods." So um, the show is is fundamentally humanist in that sense. But um, the difference between the liberalism I'm talking about and the religious wars of the of the of the 15th century is that the principles of individual of universal human rights are true, and the proposition that three gods and one god are the same thing is simply arbitrary and, no and nonsense. And that's the most important point. Um, if one disagrees with that, that's fine, but that's not what the original Star Trek was committed to. The original Star Trek was committed to this idea of universal human rights, rights being true. And the reason why this sort of rings all our libertarian bells is because the um, the original – because libertarianism is a species of liberalism. That's why. And because the, the universal human rights that we're talking about are basically a right to be let alone. It's a, basically a right to be free from interference from others. Now, in today's political culture, you very often hear people say, who are we to impose democracy on other countries? To which the right answer is democracy is not imposed. Tyranny is imposed. Democracy or universal human freedom is the natural state of man because mankind is born free. It's tyranny that's imposed. So if one person comes and tries to enslave another person and I pull out a gun and I stop him from doing that, I'm not interfering with his rights. <laughs> you, you, a, a slave owner can't complain when I liberate his slave because he had no right to enslave the man to begin with. That's the perspective of the original series Star Trek, and it's a perspective within libertarianism. Now, within libertarianism, you also have this hands-off, non-interference notion, and a lot of libertarians – or so they call themselves, believe that non-interference trumps the principles of human rights because the principles of human rights are just our own cultural myth and that's interchangeable with the cultural myths of the other societies and therefore the clash between libertarian freedom and authoritarianism is no more universally valid than the religious wars of the 15th and 16th centuries because we're all just basically making it up. And that's a proposition that I and the original series emphatically reject. Well, it's again the the, the other alternative. I mean, aside from practicality concerns, um, is the fear that that uh, mo if you do if you do preach intervention, if I were to live in a world and I and I could get them to believe in the prime directive and follow it religiously, which of course half of Star Trek is about them breaking it constantly, um, I probably would prefer that overall as a way of maintaining freedom. Uh, because I think that generally uh, the violations of the prime directive are going to be done by people who do not agree with universal values uh, that are true throughout they, because the violation of the prime directive is going to be based off of those who have power. Sort of like I say that I don't want to do a lot of international interference in human rights stuff because a lot of times – I will do it for, agree with it for egregious circumstances but a lot of times it's going to be taken over by – international law professors who want to intervene for decidedly non-liberal reasons such as to make better labor laws or to have universal health care or a right to abortion or things like this. So it's there is a practicality right. of this and that doesn't concern yeah, you at that, all. I, I agree. Those – that is – and that what's interesting here is there's an episode of, of the original series Star Trek that kind of touches on these themes I and mean, it doesn't go too deeply into it but you can see them there and that is this, the episode Space Seed where we first are introduced to Khan, who later comes back in Star Trek II, and then later in one of the J.J. Abrams films. And what, what makes Khan particularly interesting is that he actually is a superior being. And yeah, he's in, genetically in a lot of Star superior, Trek, right? That's right. In a lot of Star Trek, the crew encounters uh, allegedly superior beings, and it turns out that they're not actually superior, that they have some sort of trick up their sleeve. But here you have a guy who actually is superior. And all the crew acknowledges it. So this is a real challenge to the principle of fundamental equality that is the basis of all human rights theories. I mean the Declaration of Independence starts with equality, not with liberty. And that's, that's 
realistic because it is because we are all equal that we are all free. It is because you have no right to – it is because you are the same essentially as I am. That means you have no inherent right to control my life and therefore you have to ask permission from me if you propose to control my life and that's what we call the social compact, right? We have government by consent. But here you have Khan who actually is a superior being. He stands in a position – relative to the crew of the Enterprise, in the same way that I stand to my pet dog. I don't have to ask my dog's consent when I tell him to get off the couch. He is an inferior being, and I tell him to get off the couch, and that's, it's as simple as that. <laughs> so what does the crew do when they encounter Khan? Khan tries to take over the Enterprise and kill the crew in order to, take, in, in order to, to become the ruler of the Starship Enterprise. The crew defeats his plans, but they don't kill him. They put him on trial, but they don't convict him. What Captain Kirk does is he says, look, you have all this strength. You really are a powerful, unique creature with special gifts. So what we're going to do is we're going to put you on an unpopulated planet and give you the chance to create a society and make you a pioneer to put your great energies to work in a constructive way. That's a good thing. Now, of course, 20 years later, we t it turns out that that experiment failed, and that's why we have Star Trek II. But at the time the episode was filmed, nobody knew that that was coming, so you have to take it on its own terms. Here you have libertarianism in the broad sense, I think. Libertarianism's answer to that question, which is within the boundaries of respecting individual rights – Yes, you can do what you like, hands off. These bound we are non-negotiable on the principle that every being has the right to live their lives on their own terms. But within those boundaries, yeah, you can have all sorts of cultural variation and, and different practices and so forth. But we're not going to erase those boundaries. Once you do, once you get into a completely relativistic sense where every society has the right to govern itself regardless or or even to depict the idea of human rights in a different way, which means overriding it and saying, well, in our society, like in uh, in in uh, Borat when he says, you know, she she has no name because she is girl. You know, if we if we're not going to go that far, we're not going to take our relativism to that extent. So speaking of Khan, I want to turn to the the new movies, which I mean, you are you are on record as being, let's say, not a fan of J.J. J. Abrams' work on Star Trek and. I'm not terribly either but it largely has to do with a concern about why anyone would ever let Damon Lindelof write a script. Um, but you know those there, wait a minute there, there were scripts to those movies <laughs> questionably but um, so what's outside of problems with characterization or problems with enormous plot holes and nonsensical decision making from the political standpoint what's wrong with the new Star Trek movies? Oh, I don't think we have enough time for all of it. Um, so the the problem is begins basically with J.J. Abrams acknowledging that he's neither a fan of Star Trek nor has he actually watched Star Trek. He acknowledged in an interview that he found Star Trek boring and really wasn't a fan of it. Well, if you don't like your material, you have no business making the movie. Um, contrast that, for example, with the director of the recent film of Les Miserables that won so many Oscars and deservedly so. It's a f an amazing masterpiece of film. And in the, he, in an interview about the same time, said that he basically ate, breathed, and slept Victor Hugo for years before making that film. So you have a, a – if you don't like your material, you shouldn't be making the movie. That's the basic problem. Now, what Abrams' films come out doing is being basically just sort of a pastiche and a really bad pastiche of the original Star Trek where Kirk is all about having sex with the girls – and he's all about emotional impulses and, and so forth, and he's no reasoning. Now, the original Captain Kirk is a very intelligent guy. He's a competent scientist, for one thing. He's modeled on Captain James Cook, the great 18th century explorer who, was a, who rose from a, a – you know, and he was not a nobleman. He was an average commoner, and he rose to become a fellow of the Royal Society and the greatest explorer in the history of the earth. Um, when you he, so he's modeled on that, and he, and he's a very intelligent, thoughtful leader. Yeah, you know he's he's a ladies' man, but he respects women in a way that the new Kirk does not. Uh, and I and what you end up with when you have a a drama that's centered around these emotional impulses and things is they have no real reason for respecting Captain Kirk. Why should Kirk be captain of the Enterprise instead of say Spock? And the answer we're given in a sort weird sort of deus ex machina way when Leonard Nimoy appears as Spock from another dimension to tell them that Captain Kirk should be captain of the Enterprise just because – 
And that's it. He just says, that's the one rule you must not break. Why? I don't know. He just – because even though in one of the Abrams movies, Captain Kirk has this this monologue where he explains that he has no idea what he's doing. He doesn't know why he's captain of the Enterprise, and he, sh- he shouldn't be running things. As, I mean it's it's truly a chaos that does not withstand any kind of intellectual scrutiny. It's presented as this – and the problem with that is if that is correct, if Kirk should be the ruler just because, well, then why shouldn't Khan be the ruler? If Khan is a superior being, genetically engineered Superman, as we're told, then why shouldn't he be the captain of the Enterprise? And we're never given an answer to that. The only time that they have an approach giving an answer to that in Star Trek Into Darkness is in the very last moment when Captain Kirk gives this speech at Starfleet Academy and he says, you know, there's these bad guys out there, but we're not like them because that's not who we are. That's it. The phrase, that's not who we are, is invoked as a cover, as an explanation for the entire movie. And we're never ex- told why that's not who we are or why it shouldn't be. I mean, it just – it makes no sense. And in order to cover up the fact that it makes no sense, J.J. J. Abrams films long for a strong man to come and impose his will because he's stronger, which again is is the opposite of what the original Star Trek stood for. So now, Tim, the most important final question from someone as qualified to talk about Star Trek as you is, is what is the correct solution to the Kobayashi Maru test? <laughs> so the Kobayashi Maru test is, is a, a, an unwinnable test in which uh, it's to evaluate Starfleet uh, candidates for, for command and test their command abilities before they go out into space and actually run a starship. And it's unwinnable. So the, the idea behind it is to, to just to see what you would do if you were in a situation where there is no escape. And it's revealed in Star Trek II that Kirk took the test three times and failed and finally just figured out a way to reprogram the computer so that the test could be won. And he got a commendation for original thinking in doing so. And that's the right answer is to reprogram the, the simulation. It's, it, and, and that, I think, is what Roddenberry would say. Roddenberry would say life is a no-win scenario. Everybody's going to die. And, and if you're looking for some utopian fairy tale solution to that conundrum, you're not going to find one. So the solution is to reprogram the scenario. The solution is to think about what it is that you want from life. You're here on Earth, and you have all these great potentials because you're a human being. So – Find a way to do some good with it. Find a way to pursue happiness, to dis- to make some great scientific discovery, to become the best writer or thinker that you can be, or to to be the best marathon runner, or even or to be the best parent you can be, or some way to use the special fire that you have as a human being to light up the world, because otherwise the world is just darkness. There's a line in Edmond Rostand's play. Uh, Chanticleer, which is about a rooster who is persuaded that his crowing causes the sun to rise, and all the other animals make fun of him for it, until one moment when he says, the reason I knew that my crowing caused the sun to rise is that the darkness celebrated my silence. That's the, the what the universe is going to do if we don't devote ourselves to the principles of civilization and progress that the original Star Trek stood for. So I think that's the solution to the Kobayashi Maru scenario, is to reject the premise that life is a no-win scenario. That's why Captain Kirk is a hero, because he does that. And that's why he says in Star Trek II, I don't believe in the no-win scenario. And he's right. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.